Pregnancy isn't just about growing a baby. It's about watching that mom's changing body too. And the NCLEX loves to test on gestational diabetes because one small risk can mean a big complication for both mom and baby. Hi everyone, I'm Miriam, and today we're gonna make GDM simple, easy, and you'll be test ready. So what does the placenta have to do with gestational diabetes? Well, the placenta is a sugar gatekeeper and it's gonna let glucose in, but it's also a little hormone factory. And some of those hormones are gonna block insulin and and cause resistance. Gestational diabetes happens in the second and third trimester. Why? Well, that's because that's when that placenta is pumping out its own hormones. So that's estrogen, progesterone, and cortisol, and they all block insulin. Now, the result? Well, mom's blood sugar is going to climb and baby's going to get extra glucose and both face complications. Basically, as that placenta grows, its hormones block insulin's action. So mom's sugar rises, setting the stage for gestational diabetes. Now, why is this a problem? Well, persistent hyperglycemia can cause the baby to become macrosomic or big or cause birth complications for mom like postpartum hemorrhage. Now, this will usually resolve postpartum because that hormone factory or that placenta has been detached and the insulin insulin resistance is going to dramatically decrease. Now that we know why, let's see who's at risk. So anything that's going to put more strain on that body or that would increase insulin resistance are going to increase the risk for gestational diabetes. So overweight moms, history of GDM, a maternal age over 25, and certain ethnic groups, and of course, a family history of diabetes. So what assessment findings on a client would make you think that they might have GDM? Well, obviously having hyperglycemia, right? And the three Ps are going to strike again. The same classic three Ps with other non-gestational types of diabetes, polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia, are going to show up here too. Plus, a clue for the NCLEX. An increasing fundal height larger than expected, and this can be because of macrosomia or polyhydramnios, which is that excess amniotic fluid. But what causes macrosomia and polyhydramnios to make that fundal height be larger than expected? Well, maternal hyperglycemia means that there's excess circulating glucose. So that means excess glucose crosses that placenta. So now that fetus is hyperglycemic. And the same polyuria that can happen in an adult happens with the baby too. So we get that fetal polyuria, which is going to lead to poly hydramnios, that excess amniotic fluid, and that's going to increase that funnel height. And the fetal hyperglycemia will also cause that fetus to secrete more insulin. It's important to understand that mom's glucose crosses the placenta, but not insulin. So that baby is going to make and secrete its own insulin in response to that high sugar. And what type of hormone is insulin? It's a growth hormone. And friends, that's what's gonna make that baby big or macrosomic. It's from excess insulin secretion. So big sugar numbers make a big baby from high insulin amounts. And a big baby means increased fundal height. So you have a client that's Hispanic, obese, and she's over age 25. You know that she's high risk, but how are we gonna test her to see if she has GDM? Well, screening happens at 24 to 28 weeks, and we screen all patients. So clients will first have a non-fasting one-hour glucose challenge test where they drink a sugary glucola drink and their blood sugar is checked one hour after. If that blood sugar is less than 140 after that one-hour test, then she is negative for gestational diabetes. But if it's over 140, it's abnormal, and we're going to go to step two, which is a fasting two-hour test, and this is to confirm GDM. So one hour to screen, two hours to confirm. Now, a positive test is not the end. It's just the start of the need for tight glycemic control management. All right, time for your first NCLEX quick check. So pause and answer. At what gestational age are clients screened for gestational diabetes? This is gonna be 24 to 28 weeks gestation. And remember, we screen everyone. What are two steps of screening for gestational diabetes? Well, we do a non-fasting one hour oral glucose challenge test followed by a confirmatory test if needed, and that's a fasting two-hour glucose challenge test. Now, the number one priority for clients with diabetes during pregnancy is to maintain tight glycemic control, and that's to ensure that we have good maternal and fetal well-being. We also want to prevent complications. So our interventions are going to focus on teaching diabetes management. We want to monitor maternal and fetal well-being, and we want to manage birth and newborn complications. Now, treatment is going to start with lifestyle changes and focus on diet and exercise. Insulin is only added if diet and exercise aren't working. So we'll teach clients to exercise 30 to 60 minutes a day. We'll teach them to eat three meals a day and two to three snacks and to never skip meals. And we want them to eat a high fiber diet with complex carbs, things like brown rice. And we want to limit simple sugars like white bread and candy, all the good stuff. 
Since tight glycemic control is our number one priority, we need to teach clients to monitor their glucose. And what if hyperglycemia persists? Well, if hyperglycemia persists, that means diet and exercise likely are not as effective as we would like them to be. So we might need to add or increase insulin. So first food and fitness, then insulin if needed. And don't forget, these clients need to know hypoglycemic management too. So we want to teach them to watch out for signs like being shaky, clammy, and confused. That means that they're hypoglycemic and they need to know how to treat this. So we treat hypoglycemia with the rule of 15. So that's gonna be 15 grams of carbs followed by rechecking in 15 minutes. All right, time for your next quick check. So pause and answer. Do all GDM clients need insulin? No, remember we start with diet and exercise first and only add insulin if needed. How many meals and snacks should a client with GDM consume daily? Remember, we want three meals a day and two to three snacks and never skip a meal. So even after all this work, if sugars run wild, what can happen to mom and baby? Well, uncontrolled hyperglycemia during pregnancy can cause several maternal and fetal complications. So let's take a closer look at mom first. So if she has hyperglycemia that is persistent then she has excess circulating glucose. This can cause vascular damage, which can lead to preeclampsia or hypertension. So we need to teach clients to report any vision changes or headaches. Now this vascular damage is gonna also decrease placental perfusion. So remember when blood sugar is high, the blood is thick. So picture syrup or honey and how thick and slow that pours compared to a bottle of water where there's no sugar. So this means the placenta would not be getting perfused well because that blood is thick and not moving as fast. So that baby is not going to get the oxygen and nutrients to grow, and that could cause IUGR. And as we said before, maternal hyperglycemia is going to cause that excess glucose to cross the placenta. So that fetus is going to secrete more insulin to take care of that hyperglycemia. And insulin is a growth hormone. So that hyperinsulinemia can cause macrosomia. It causes that baby to grow big. But what happens at delivery? Well, all that sugar has crossed the placenta, so we have fetal hyperglycemia. And that fetus's body says, I need lots of insulin to manage this. So the fetus is gonna secrete excess insulin, but then plot twist. That baby is born and that maternal glucose supply is cut off, it's gone. So now we are at big risk for newborn hypoglycemia because that baby has made all this extra insulin but doesn't have the constant sugar source anymore. So now that you understand these complications, you understand why glycemic control is so important. So let's move to the delivery room where our management becomes critical. Now, strict glycemic control is necessary to decrease the risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. So we'll monitor maternal glucose during labor, and we'll be monitoring for complications of fetal macrosomia, so things like postpartum hemorrhage following delivery or birth injuries. Remember that that uterus is overstretched, and that's a big risk for postpartum hemorrhage because it has to work harder to contract down to stop bleeding. And of course, big babies are going to increase the risk of birth injuries. That baby grew big, but the exit is still the same size. So this could cause lacerations to the mom during delivery or birth injuries to that baby, like a broken clavicle. Now, what about that baby's blood glucose? Because we are worried about the risk of hypoglycemia for the baby, right? Well, we need to do a heel stick to assess that blood sugar. So we'll place a heel warmer on that baby and that's gonna help improve blood flow to the heel and prevent false lows. We'll obtain this blood sample from the lateral heel. If that baby is hypoglycemic, what will you do? Well, it's gonna depend on whether they are alert or not. So if the baby is hypoglycemic and alert, then they can oral feed or breastfeed. Now, if the newborn is hypoglycemic and cannot feed, maybe they're symptomatic with lethargy or respiratory distress, or maybe the sugars are persisting to stay low and we cannot bring them up, then they're gonna need IV dextrose. So after birth, we're assessing the newborn's blood glucose, but we also have to monitor for complications. How would you recognize hypoglycemia? Well, a jittery newborn is a hypoglycemic newborn until proven otherwise. So we're gonna monitor for jitters and tremors. Hypothermia is another big symptom of hypoglycemia in the newborn. Their little bodies are struggling to function the way that they should because their blood glucose is low. So they're gonna have a hard time controlling their body temperatures. Newborns can also have low blood glucose because they're hypothermic. And that's because they're using more energy to try and get warm and they're gonna burn up all their sugar. And we wanna be alert for respiratory distress too. Insulin inhibits surfactant production in the fetal lungs, and that's going to make those alveoli collapse. So be alert for signs of respiratory distress like grunting or tachypnea. All right, time for your next quick check. Pause to answer.
What signs indicate newborn hypoglycemia and how do we assess the newborn's blood glucose? Well, signs are going to be persistent jitters or hypothermia, and we're going to do a lateral heel stick from a warmed heel. All right, let's lock in the NCLEX must nose. We screen everyone at 24 to 28 weeks with a one hour glucose challenge test. And our first line is going to be diet and exercise and then insulin if needed. Biggest complications are postpartum hemorrhage for the mom. So remember that fetal macrosomia and hypoglycemia for that baby. So we'll monitor postpartum for bleeding and watch for those persistent tremors and jitters for that baby. On the NCLEX, remember that placental hormones cause insulin resistance. So we fight back with food, fitness, and sometimes insulin. Bottom line, tight glycemic control protects both mom and baby from complications. All right, you're ready for gestational diabetes on the NCLEX.